Hello and welcome to another conversation with Elizabeth Ellen Carter. I'm Emily Royal and I'm stepping into the hot seat today to interview Elizabeth Ellen Carter about her spooky story. We are both in an anthology coming out on the 21st of October, which is called Upon a Midnight Dreary, a fantastic anthology of spooky and romantic tales in a variety of historical settings, including Regency and Medieval, brought to you from Dragon Blade Publishing, just right for Halloween. So Elizabeth, um, it's morning here in the UK, but um, it's much the evening for you. So good evening. How are you doing in Australia? I'm doing very well. And you know what? I feel like I'm in the hot seat. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm used to asking the questions not being asked. So, so let's see I if I can we... make a good interview subject. <laughs> It'll be a good chance, yeah, and I'm hoping I'm going to make a good interview as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were given this brief, weren't we, about um, real real life British ghosts and writing a story around around those so what did you think of the brief we were given were you excited about it I I loved it because I was in the speaking of, of binging uh binging things I've had spent a um over the the Christmas break um binging a lot of Emma James uh stories he was a Victorian um uh history professor and also uh, a ghost story writer par excellence he, he's absolutely great and on youtube there is a, um, uh, a a british actor by the name of michael horden who has done uh narrations of his short stories so <laughs> that that was, going was through my, <laughs> that was going through my head when, when we got the brief from Catherine, so it's sort of right. That's that's the tack that I want to take with that. So um, I know that a, a lot of the stories will probably be a, around the Regency era, but I I pitched mine absolutely mid Victorian. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, I know um, Alexa Aston in the anthology. She's because she writes both medieval and Regency, and I think she's combined the two. I think her ghosts. A medieval but it's set in the regency period which i <laughs> thought was rather was rather fun so yours is victorian um it, so how did you go about your research because i'm i'm really lucky because my ghost is literally just down the road within walking distance um but you are <laughs> literally on the other side of the world so how did you feel about your research for, for that was it difficult um I, because I had the, the mood in mind, I, I wanted something set in, in Southern England. So either, either Cornwall or, or Devon. And in the end, I picked Devon and based mine on the, the ghosts that said to haunt, um, haunt the Berry Pomeroy Castle. And there's three of them and I've chosen the White Lady. And uh, there's a little bit of a dual timeline in, in mine as well, because um, my story is called The Ghost Bride. And the, uh, the, the ghost herself is a, uh, a young Tudor woman. So, oh, uh, nice. so I get to, get to have a, a little time shift uh, play in there as well. So um, Berry Pomeroy Castle, I just binged everything that there was on it, um, read a lot online. Uh, again, uh, there were uh, YouTube um, visitor tours, uh, people who've, who've been there. So I really could walk through the place. So I really got a, like yeah, a sense of feel uh, for it as well. Oh, so um, uh, that's, that's great fun. And to pay homage to Mr. James, the hero's name is Mont uh, Montague Rhodes. Uh, which oh, is the um, MR from yeah, MR James. <laughs> so he's known as Monty and he is a historian. And he's been invited by a friend of his, a, uh, uh, a, a rector, uh, sorry, a deacon in a, uh, a, a neighboring village uh, who wants a survey done of an old church in the uh, little village. And I've renamed Barry Pomeroy. Um, so I've, I've fictionalized that um, to see if there's some connection between the, uh, the church and the castle, which is about a mile away. Okay. And uh, 
Um, fate brings our heroine, who's a travel writer, and, and Monty together, sort of bound for the same destination. And oh. the, uh, the ghost bride is uh, who disappeared on her uh, wedding day and um, appears, to, appears to lovers through the centuries. And although our hero and heroine aren't lovers yet, they certainly are by the end of the story. Oh, and does the ghost cause problems for them? Or is that a spoiler? Um, well, it's, yeah, yes, yes, she does, she does, she does cause a bit of a scene, I'll put it that way. <laughs> okay, oh, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> and is your story linked to a series at all, or links to any characters in your other books? Um, no, not this one, although I rather like the idea of um, creating a, a new series, which <laughs> on top of the other series that I'm working on at the moment, the, uh, um, the uh, Ladies London Observer is, um, is the paper that the heroine works for. And I rather like the idea of a, uh, a series set around the paper. Um, and I think there's, there's some um, great avenues there, particularly setting it in Victorian England, where women were entering the workforce in, in larger numbers. And, um, you know, a, examining the dynamic that falls out of the Industrial Revolution and the, uh, and the greater drive towards uh, universal enfranchisement. So, um, so that, that is on the drawing board for some time in the future. Yeah, Ladies London Observer, that sounds like a great name for, uh, for a series. I think that sounds excellent. Looking forward to that. Do, do you find that when you're, when you're writing a book that you get, you then get ideas that sort of spark off and shoot off in different directions and you think, oh, I've got to write that down because I can write an eight book series out of, out of that. And then it's like, where am I going to find the time to do that? <laughs> yes, yes. And, and it's funny, um, the... My another series that I've got coming out, book one, I think it's not up for pre-order yet. I suspect it will be either very end of the year or, or early next. In the last third, there are um, five characters that, that get introduced quite lightly towards the end. They all want their own books. So one of them will be making a, uh, an appearance in the Lion's Den series. And four oh. of them will be sisters. And to add a, a degree of difficulty, I'm looking at making the series, the Asquith sisters. They all find their, um, their heroes at, in, in one summer at one house party. So, so we've got some elements that are, that are going to be um, common, common events that run through the series, but seen through the eyes of, of a different sister each time who, oh. who may be greater or lesser involved in, in that. And yeah, so they, these characters don't make it easy on me. <laughs> they don't. I always thought it was a bit of an urban, urban myth when I started out writing because people say oh my characters start talking to me and they insist on having their own book and I'm like what are you talking about and then when it actually happens happens to you it's it is quite weird they start chatting to you uh, a real peripheral character sometimes somebody you don't like they chat yeah. away and chat away and then you wake up the next morning and think okay I'm actually going to have to write their own book and make them a bit more sympathetic and it's it's funny how just whole ideas like that spark off from something that you never intended you think where did that come from <laughs> uh, yeah yeah ab absolutely and it's sort of no and I think you've got to be a, a writer to uh, to appreciate that because mm. sort of when when people ask what you do and, and you say well I just talk to to the voices inside my head they rather think you're a bit crazy yeah <laughs> Or you often get when you say when you say you're a writer, people go, "Oh, okay. So what what do you do for your your actual real job?" It's like, no, 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 no. This, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a real job. <laughs> so, have you ever um, written a ghost story before? Do you do you like spooky tales? I I do uh, like a, a sort of a little bit of you know, is it or isn't it? Um, I did write 
um, a medieval with uh, with light supernatural uh, overtones. The uh, um, the heroine sees her um, missing friend, her, her you know childhood friend, uh, in a in a series of of really weird dreams. Um, but the, those dreams then work themselves out into they're almost like premonitions for her. And and each each time um, her her friend who on spoiler alert <laughs> turns out to uh, you know has died um, is is trying to give our heroine warnings. So um, sort of is, is it is it a dream or, or or is there more to it than that? Sort of it's nice to make uh, to uh, let the reader make up their own mind yes. how much they want to read into it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, my ghost story is a little bit like that because it, it's kind of sightings and things happening, but you, yeah, you still never know whether it actually is is a ghost. It's all a bit sort of myth mythical, I, su I suppose. Is that the same with the, the ghost in your in your story, the ghost bride, or is it definitely definitely a ghost? It's it's definitely definitely a, a ghost. Um, initially, only the heroine um, sees the ghost bride. Um, but um, it's it, uh, there's there's one scene there where there's this sort of terrible terrible scream in the middle of the night. Uh, the hero rushes down sort of one floor to the to the heroine's room to make sure she's she's okay. Um, you know the heroine is is at the window, having just seen the the ghost bride there, but um, he he doesn't. But he says he definitely heard the did, heard the scream and and says well i i know you if you say you saw something then then i believe you saw something Ooh. so so what does that mean so they have a little bit of a, a history um the innkeeper has, has told them the legend of the ghost bride so yeah. um so They've got the the means and the opportunity to do some further investigation at the castle, uh, just oh. to see to see what they can uncover and, and see if they can finally lay the ghost to rest. Yeah, it's yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Sometimes you get, you get lots of, lots of ideas, and there's just one that that just again, it, you think it's an urban myth, but it just speaks to you, and you think, yes, I I have to get this story down because it's it's in my head, and mm. I'm going to go a little bit crazy if I just don't write it down because it's not it's not going away. Well, that's it. Um, as coincidence would would have it, um, uh, Maggie Anderson ended up picking the same ghost. Really? So yeah, yeah. So uh, um, I'm I'm looking forward to to seeing what she's uh, she's doing with that one. Obviously, really? sort of two completely different stories. What what I find really funny is is Maggie and I are both Australians, so so there's sort of this. <laughs> double connection there as well but I promise we haven't been looking over each other's shoulders <laughs> that is going to be interesting to see how that how that pans out because I know the the Christmas anthology that we did um last year was based on Dickens A Christmas Carol mm. but every story was again the the brief was just amazing it was quite loose but every story was completely different and you think yeah. but it's based on this one Christmas story that was actually quite a short story as well you know and how mm. could you get 20 odd completely different stories from that but it yeah it just shows sometimes we think oh well we plagiarize the story but actually we, we do end up inputting an awful lot in the creative process I think to really make the story our own and you see that when everyone's working to the same brief and kind of like just yeah and and I mean this this is it and I may I think maybe the way to look at it is where where Stand, we, we've got one point we're standing on, but we're we're shoulder to shoulder facing outwards, and and as we as we write our stories, we're moving in opposite directions, and and you know that's how we end up making it our own, um, uh, especially when there's a tie into an existing series. Yeah, um, that that makes a big difference. Um, yeah. And what what about your Christmas story for this year? Oh, that's um, yeah. I I really struggled with that one because um, mm -hmm. I, I struggled with the idea, and I I had a sort of vague idea of which series I was going to tie it to, and which kind of characters 
from the series were, were going to be sort of the main characters in the story, even though the others were going to feature. And I sort of thought about the setting and thought about the overall theme. I kind of picked my Christmas song, which is um, all I want for Christmas is, is you. So kind of the whole theme is, yeah, I don't want material things. I don't want riches. I don't want titles. I just want the man I love, um, which I thought was quite, <laughs> sweet, quite a sweet theme. And I wanted to kind of bring in this whole magic and innocence of uh, children mm -hmm. as well. And the fact that children, before they kind of lose their innocence, will, will see beyond uh, an ugly face or will see beyond a, a monster and they'll they'll sort of love the, the person within um, a, a bit more. So I wanted to kind of bring out that, but I, I really, really struggled to write it. And then the idea just smacked me over the head in the middle of the night one night and I got up the next morning and dropped <laughs> down the pot and, and, and that was it. And I'm a real, um, I'm a real plotter. So mm -hmm. I know some people will just open up the laptop and type and I just, I have not got the cojones to do that. I just think if I do that, I'm going to write 20,000 words of rubbish. And I'm going to start all over again. So I plot really, really meticulously. And I had to admit, I, I thought everybody did that. And then when some people said, no, no, I'm a discovery writer, I think is the nice way of saying it. Um, and they just do that successfully. And I, I cannot get how people are wired like that um but then they can't get how i'm wired um so to how i mean yeah. how do you do you just open the laptop and and go <laughs> uh i'm i'm half and half um but i think i think plotting is is become increasingly important and um and i found that with that christmas story um it's i've picked a secondary character from deceiving the duke the uh, the new series and yeah. To really, to um, I spent last year not doing a lot of writing, so so this year is about sort of it's almost it's almost like sort of rehabilitation when you've injured yourself, and it's sort of you've got to pace yeah. yourself, you've got to to exercise those muscles, you've got to build you on that again. First as well, I think, am I ever going to get back into this again? Uh, yeah, yeah, I I went through that quite badly in March last year. It's sort of you know um sort of the dreadful self-doubt you know um looking at everything you've done so far thinking you know oh, there's absolute crap and and even even though sort of people that you know and trust say no it's not it's sort of it, it's that little nagging thing that, that hits you yeah um so with the Christmas story, um, I took a leaf from, from Catherine Levesque's book, actually, and um, I knew what I wanted to do. I picked a, um, a traditional Gaelic, uh, Scottish Gaelic uh, Christmas carol, which, um, which took basically a story of a mother's, mother's love from, from Mary to Jesus. And um, so I, I used um the the flight into egypt uh following the uh um following herod's um murder uh, slaughter of the innocents yeah. and i i tied that into the um the clearances in the scottish highlands um oh, and so our our hero is a is a bit of a, a joseph uh character who uh um who comes to to support and then uh, you know, fall, falls in love with the the heroine and and the um, uh, and the the child who actually is her um, dead sister's uh, child um, becomes part of the the family as well and and what I do is I would get to a certain point and go okay I'm, I'm finished writing for the evening but let's do another half a dozen dot points of of where we need to go to in in this chapter, so I know where I'm going to end the chapter. Because what I try and do is is um, put it on a particular either a high note or um, or a little bit of a, a suspenseful note. So yeah. so you've got a, almost a little bit of a cliffhanger at the end of each chapter. So uh, so doing it that way has has given me a a, a real um, a, a real discipline going forward with that, which which I found really helpful. Ah, okay. Yes, I suppose I can I can see that working if you 
yeah, if you don't plot too meticulously, then actually just giving yourself something to kind of thread onto for the next the next writing mm. session. I know Catherine said once um, about about editing. She said that what she does is she'll write a chapter, and then the next day, as the editing, she'll go back and she'll read that chapter and edit it, and then move on to the next chapter. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when she gets gets to the end of the day of her chapter, she then goes back and does a little synopsis as to what's happened. So she always kind of plots backwards, which I thought was an interesting interesting way of doing it. But then that then helps her to push forward onto the next chapter, which um, yeah, it's, it's amazing, isn't it, how writers are completely different the way they they construct stories and when you write your story do you write it from start to finish or if you get to a scene that you find difficult you think oh we'll leave that and move on to a, another one or do you just blitz through the whole thing I um I write linearly usually up until the point of the saggy middle and <laughs> and it's usually okay <laughs> There is a swamp. There is a swamp that is sitting in the middle here. Um, I know I can see the other side. It's going to be great. So there have been times where I've started almost almost at the end and worked backwards to yeah. that because it's usually at that point where um, you've laid bare all the different plot threads and it's a case of, okay, um, they all need to be resolved, but uh, mm. but what steps, you know, it, it's finding, there you go, visual metaphors everywhere. It's finding those stepping stones that yeah. are there in the swamp to get get to the other side and, and you know, picking picking the right ones. Um, so, uh, but mostly it's linearly because I, I find that one of the things that I, I, write and then go back and delete is sort of if character A is in one location and needs to be in a second location, I oh. need to have straight in my oh, head how yeah. they get there, which is not necessarily the most exciting thing, but I've got a whole lot better. I don't need to write that now down, but I actually need to actually be satisfied in my head that um, it's happened that yeah. that it, it's happened that it's logically consistent and and that it's that it's doable so it's like um, it's like painting um because i i mean I've, I've sort of realized over the over the i say the years i've only been writing about three or four years that actually you don't have to put in every single scene every single piece of dialogue every single piece of action because you can kind of signpost to stuff that's happening in the future and signpost back to stuff that's happened in the past and the reader will fill in the gaps. And it's so like paintings. When I used to paint, I used to, if I was painting a tree, I would try and paint every single leaf and if I could see it. And I can remember my art teacher saying, you actually don't have to do that. The, the observer, their eye will fill in the detail. You've just got to put in blocks of color and vague bits here, there and everywhere. And they will fill in fill in the gaps so I find mm. that sometimes helps me with the saggy middle as I do think because I, I I will always write linearly because I think if I write the easy bits at the end I've got to come back to those difficult bits anyway and I'm going to get more and more um sort of self-conscious about it and you know like I have yes. lots of self I just push through it um so I kind of use that I always think of my art teacher's advice and think okay I'll skip out some scenes uh, and actually then when you come back and read it you realize yeah you didn't need them because by the time the reader gets to the end it's yeah it's all nice and nice and clear but yeah the sad yeah. middle <laughs> uh yeah and and that and that's it because it's usually at that point where your hero and heroine are, uh, are at the the low moment in the hero's journey and it's a case of okay I've absolutely destroyed them. So yeah, how do I bring, bring them back up? Sort of, yeah, no, uh, thinking about um, the Heart of the Corsairs series. Sort of, yeah, there were some really, really dark moments. Well, yeah, for... do you like to torture your characters? <laughs> um, occasionally occasionally and sometimes they they just deserve it so kit hardacre from the um from the heart of the corsair series given given another set of circumstances the guy could be an absolute asshole mm. <laughs> um and um but that that comes from this point of uh, of self-preservation with him so so sometimes he will he will 
run his mouth off when he really shouldn't. Yeah. Um, and and he relies on his wits to get himself back out. Um, but having come from that extreme sense of pain, there's this risk taking um, aspect to yeah. his nature, which which but makes we- him re- a really effective uh, hero and and a privateer. But um, there's obviously a lot of work that needs to go on that before he's husband material. Yeah, there's I've I've got I, I think there's a hero in my London Libertine series, Henry, um, and he is an absolute stinker. He behaves so badly, and it, yeah, it is because he's just not emotionally intelligent at all. He just doesn't get the whole concept of of love. He just doesn't doesn't believe in it. And then when he does, he can't cope with it, and he doesn't want to show affection to the woman he loves because he doesn't want to expose his heart and then he's investigating all these 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 murders and abductions and he wants to keep her protected and he's he feels that the only way he can keep her protected is to is to drive her away so Mm. um i mean he behaves so badly um i mean he does grovel at the end but but yeah i i love characters that that do that 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 have these sort of horrible traits that they have to learn to become husband material throughout throughout the book and sometimes i also like characters where when you get to the end of the book you're still not quite sure if they're completely reformed because actually in real life people don't suddenly turn from anti-hero to hero so there's still yeah. a, a little bit of doubt at the end think yep okay happy ending but actually these couple this couple is still going to have to work to <laughs> work together otherwise he might just yeah relive his bad ways again well well that that's it which is, which is why in the end um kit ends up with a um, a really pronounced limp um after badly breaking his uh, leg um during enacting this moment of of revenge on a yeah, on a corsair who uh, uh, with revenge comes a price <laughs> and and that's and that's it and he ends up paying a a terrible price and it's been, it was interesting because i wrote him into um actually one of the christmas stories i'm most pleased with is one called father's day and um, oh, I, my Kindle, I think, and and that that um, links the uh, Heart of the Corsair series to the King's Rogue series, because uh, Catherine asked me if I had any more Hardacre stories, and I said mm. the three book um, uh, Corsair series. The third book ends up it being the um, the prequel to the uh, to the first one so oh. so the entire universe is self-contained so i i ended up writing kit hardacre's father and uh, he he turns he turns out to be a, a very young father he uh, he gets uh, this girl pregnant the uh, uh, the squire's daughter pregnant when he's 15 and um, father finds out he has him shanghaied into the navy um, and the the daughter sent off. Uh, the daughter dies in in childbirth. So so Adam Hardacre um, only learns of the existence of his son um, more than twenty years after the fact. And at that point, from from records, he believes his son is dead. But in uh, in Father's Day, um, I bring Kit back to to England. Um, to try and find out a, a little bit about his past because he was raised as, um, as an orphan and went to sea as a cabin boy. Um, and and um, sort of getting the dynamic of, of the, these sort of two men who, who are connected by blood but who are otherwise strangers to one another um, no. and, and how, how to build that relationship there. Um, it, it's actually... One of the short stories I'm most proud of. And does Kit's father get get a happy ending? Because I, I quite uh, like it. Yes, him. yes. Um, he is the hero of the uh, um, the King's Rogue series. So uh, in the um, um, his his heroine Olivia is the governess to the uh, family. The the squire remarried had a uh, another daughter the heroine was governess to uh, to that daughter um the uh, the the new widow and the the daughter um 
decide to leave Cornwall for uh, for London. Uh, the governor stays on to uh, help tidy up the estate. Uh, she learns about the older daughter that nobody ever talked about and starts beginning to piece uh, what happened to her. Um, Adam, Hardacre, Adam Hardacre um, is employed uh, as, a, uh, as a spy and he returns to his home village and uh, that's where he and the heroine meet. So, okay. uh, so there's this sort of dual story of, of the spy story, which connects the, uh, the three stories and, um, and sort of going back into, into Adam's past. So that was good fun. That's amazing. So um, what are you planning to write, to write next? What are you, because you mentioned that you'd had a bit of, a bit of a hiatus last year and then you've got lots mm -hmm. of things coming up next, uh, next year. I do. I, I'm plotting. Believe it or not, I'm plotting. I am doing a uh, an outline, a full outline this month for the second book in the London Gems series. So, mm -hmm. Deceiving the Duke is the uh, the first. A Curio for the Count is the second. And um, the heroine is a little bit different. She and her family run a uh, uh, an auctioneering business, which uh, and as part of the the side business, um, sells. Uh, curios and the family has a reputation of being able to find uh, particular objects so they're commissioned to to source particular um, uh, objects um, they're trusted by members of the aristocracy to discreetly um, dispose of of items if they happen to be low in funds so uh, so she she crosses into um, the um, you know, different echelons in society. Uh, the hero is a French count, and of course, sort of at this stage, his lands are gone. He he and his mother uh, fled when he was three years old, so he's been oh, brought okay. up yeah. quintessentially English. But he gets um, there are a certain sort of a dream that he has, um, which in the end centers on this this particular clock and uh, um, so he's he's in search of this clock the heroine receives a mysterious commission from a third party to find this clock and the clock holds a particular secret that another third party <laughs> wants oh. desperately and is prepared to kill for it so, so how did uh, you come up with the clock sorry how did you come up with the idea of a, of a clock? Um, it came in a dream because when I pitched it to Catherine, I had an object, sort of a curio, a, an ill-defined thing. And then I was thinking about it a couple of months ago. And uh, just before I went to, to sleep, it was sort of I had this, this dream of this clock. It's a st statue clock, um, you know, a like a figure of Diana, but in, in one hand, she's holding the clock with the clock face, pendulum, and it's sort of, that's the thing. That's Amazing. the thing that I didn't know I was looking for, and now I've got it. <laughs> so, so I mentioned it to my husband, and while we were doing yard work a, a few weeks ago, sort of back and forth to the, to the tip, <laughs> we worked out why this clock was significant and, and, the, this great adventure sort of came out and it sort of, oh, that's great. That's, that's great. Fun. It's fantastic that you use that you use your husband for ideas. I, I've done that with my, um, actually my youngest daughter. We've taken the dog for a walk and we've talked through plots and we, and she's come up with names for the plot, names for all the characters. And it's uh, it's great, isn't it? When you can bring someone else, someone else into the, into the creative process. It, it is because in a way, when you're writing, you're, you're having conversations with yourself and, and um, to me, the characters become real when you can actually take them out of here and put them here. Um, yeah. and, and to do that, you actually, you actually need to speak it out. So yeah. having, having somebody that you can trust to do that just makes such a difference. Yeah, it's not any problem, isn't it? If you talk, sometimes if you talk it through, just, just you having to articulate the question. By the time you've asked the question, you think, oh, no. No, I know the answer. 
yes. all the odds and I'm just yeah. by voice of Oh dear. Oh, this has been such fun. Thank you so much for, for letting me interview you. I wanted to make sure you had your um your opportunity to highlight your your stories. So yeah, really looking forward to uh, reading about the ghost, the ghost bride. Um so the ghost bride is going to be in the anthology upon a midnight dreary. So it's available to pre-order now on all platforms, just 99 cents, absolute bargain, published on October the 21st. Do not miss it. Thoroughly recommend it. And thank you. You've been an absolutely perfect interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> this has been so much fun. Thank you. Cheers.